Hello, welcome to this session on experimental analysis and engineering. We learn about how to obtain reliable data and draw inferences from them in a scientific way. In the first past part of this session, we'll focus on experimental data gathering and how to handle uncertainties. You have carried out experiments in your physics and chemistry labs in the past. The kind of experiments you'll be carrying out now in engineering labs are a little different, but in an important way. Early experiments were simple. They were well-behaved systems used to illustrate theory using simple measurements of say concentration, voltage, current, structure, and so on. However, in engineering labs, you will most likely encounter non-ideal systems with a non-linear behavior. There will be interferences from several factors which we normally ignore in ideal conditions. Disturbances are mostly the norm rather than exceptions. Let us look at what the disturbances mean on a graph. In the first graph, we have thermal conductivity as a function of temperature. Two different measurements have been made here. They are also compared against what is known from literature. Observe the closest closeness to which all of them agree. This is what we mean by a near ideal system. What you see here is what you expect from an ideal system. No matter who does the experiment or how many times, the data shows a regular behavior. This is in contrast to what we see on the right. Here, the heat transfer coefficient is measured and compared against what is known. We see there is a lot of scatter in the data here. There are two points to note here. One, the data is showing a constant deviation from the curve. And two, at a given location, we have different values for the heat transfer coefficient. There seems to be an inherent disturbance causing these fluctuations. In this session, we learn how to handle these variations and what we can learn from it. Let us zoom out and take a broader view now. Why do we do experiments at the first place? There are two major goals of experimentation. First is empiricism. That is to gain practically useful knowledge. And the second is to be able to generalize with a theory. Even if we can't obtain a theory, practical knowledge is particularly useful for engineers. For example, even without knowing the underlying physics, an engineer can know that if I increase a parameter A, I know that the variable Y will decrease by a factor F. This is very helpful in taking quick decisions. For example, in designing a product to troubleshoot industrial problems and to improve the performance of existing processes. Equally important aspect of experimentation is to be able to understand nature, relating different phenomena and generalizing to different, discover minimal laws of physics. Unless we have carefully performed experiments, we would not be able to test new hypotheses. Is there a systematic way to carry out experiments? We can think of three important stages. The first is to introduce a disturbance in the independent variable. And observe its dependence on the dependent variable. For example, we can enlist the dependence of F on three independent variables, u, v, and w. Some of them 
may have an influence and some of them may not. But we don't know this for sure unless we do the experiment. The second step is to check for this behavior, whether this behavior is reproducible. That is, we do it several times, done by different persons at different times and at different locations. This is done to rule out any bias introduced by humans in the conduct of the experiment. In this process, we can get several values of f for a given value of u. At a value of u equal to u0, we have f1, f2, f3 are the different values that we measure. Why do we get different values? Simply because each time we repeat the experiment, there could be some unknown variation we have introduced. Or there could be some inherent noise or fluctuations, which is mainly due to temperature, that has caused this variation. How do we proceed? We simply take an average of all these values and obtain a confidence interval using the standard deviation sigma naught. We can say that at u equal to u0, f is some f0 bar plus or minus sigma naught. And this is at a 65% confidence. This means This means that if we were to repeat the experiment with all these variations, then 67% of the observations will fall within this interval. A common misconception is that the error bars are obtained by computing the deviations from a curve fitted line. This is incorrect. Error bars on experimental data denote the confidence interval obtained purely from actual observations and not in comparison with any other fitting line. Remember that we don't yet know the math mathematical functional form of f of u. And that is the third step, which is to determine the a functional form of f of u. In the next few slides, we'll see some methods to find possible functional forms. Once found, we can fit expressions to the data. Because the experimental data is itself scattered, the function we fit is also certain only to within some confidence bound. This means that we have to report confidence interval even for the fitting parameters. For example, if f is a linear function of u, then there are two parameters, the slope m and the constant c. We'll have errors in the slope m given by m equal to m bar plus some sigma m and in the constant c given by c bar plus some sigma c. So m and c are known within some confidence interval bounds. Let us now see in detail how to obtain these error estimates. The least count errors are always present for any measurement. You have to note down the least count error for every observed variable in your experiment. The least count error is given by half of the least count of a measurement. Where possible, repeat an experiment at least three times at a given condition. Find the mean and the standard deviation from this set. The error in a measured variable x, which is denoted by delta x, is given by 
the standard deviation of this variable sigma x divided by square root of the number of point number of sample points for derived quantities we need we need to use the error propagation formula for simple multiplicative functions given by this kind of generic expressions where f is a function of x bar m y bar n and z bar p and these three are the measured variables the error in these three measured variables can be propagated and to find the confidence interval or the error in the derived variable f and this is given by the square of the uns relative uncertainty in f is simply the sum of the squares of relative uncertainties in each of these variables weighted by the exponent for more details and general expression of this error propagation formula please consult fox and mcdonald fluid mechanics textbook in appendix f having computed the errors of measurement we now wish to report an average of the measured variable it is important to keep in mind its uncertainty spreadsheets and numerical software which are used to compute averages and derived quantities usually report numbers up to 16 digit precision for example we have a derived quantity f which is given by 1976.8523 and so on it is a common error for newbies to report this with two decimal or four decimal places like this however this is completely arbitrary firstly thinking in terms of decimal point accuracy does not make any sense for physical quantities why because we can simply convert it into another unit where the decimal point can be shifted to the left or to the right what is actually important is the number of significant digits the number of significant digits to report actually depends on the uncertainty of the quantity once we have determined the uncertainty by either direct measurement or by error propagation we can decide the significant digits here are some examples of such representation if the uncertainty in this value f bar is 0.0043 then we keep one significant digit in the uncertainty which is 0.004 and then report the the value only up to these three decimal places as in the uh, uncertainty so it is written as 1976.852 plus or minus 0.004 and similarly we have several other examples if the number uh, if the uncertainty is pretty high like what is here uncertainty in f is 1182 then if we uh, take the sig most significant uh, digit it is 1000 and the uh, value has to be reported as 2000 plus or minus 1000 we now have our uncertainties computed and reported in the necessary significant digits the next stage is to obtain mathematical generalization using graphical analysis graphical analysis provides a quick visual approach to observe patterns and arrive at fitting functions it is important to use scientific plotting software gnu plot grace matplotlib are some powerful open source versions widely used by scientists worldwide commercial software such as origin 
Sigma plot, MATLAB are also favored by students who are comfor comfortable with a graphical user interface. Please do not use any spreadsheet software to carry out any serious analysis. It is only helpful to carry out quick look at the trends, but not for uh, error analysis. This is because only scientific software such as these can understand how to handle uncertainties and error bars. Always plot the experimental data with error bars and use them for curve fitting. All scientific plotting software also use a nonlinear least square algorithm for curve fitting. We need a figure, we need to figure out a way to find the mathematical functions for the curve fitting. How to guess this functional form of f of u for curve fitting? The most important thing to remember is that the guess depends on the extent of experimental confidence intervals. Let us see an illustration of this. Here, we have set of data that seems to be linear. F seems to be linear in U. If somebody gives you, uh, but this data does not have any confidence intervals. If somebody gives you this data and asks you to fit a curve to it, you must say that I can't give you a confident answer unless you give me the confidence intervals. Let us say the confidence interval looks something like this. Here you see the error bars are very large. Large meaning the size of the intervals is of the same order as the maximum variation in F. So the maximum variation in F goes from say about uh, five to about eight, which is about three to four. And the error bars are also of that size, three to four. What does this mean? This means that we must use a single parameter function, which is f of u equal to constant, which is just a flat line. If, however, we had the confidence intervals as shown in this plot, all for the same data, only the confidence interval has changed. Here, the, con the height of the confidence in interval is smaller than the actual variation in F. Now we can say that F is likely to be a linear function in U, or we can fit F of U equal to mu plus C. To summarize, it is important to first plot the experimental data with the experimental error bars. And then we can conclude on the possible mathematical functions to fit. The most common approach to find this function f of u is to look for similar dependence found by somebody else earlier. That is, look for similar systems or known theory in some ideal case. The standard experiments you perform in the lab are usually well established. This means that the dependence is well understood. You would be given the functional form or you would have studied it in a theory course. These are some examples of some functions with two and three free parameters. The first is a power law, come, which has uh, different asymptotes for different regions. And the second is the familiar exponential decay. All you have to do is to choose an appropriate linear or a log scale for the axis and fit the functions. In case we have no clues on the dependence, then the problem becomes one of hit and trial. 
how for this we can first play around with the axis you have to replot the data with either one or both the axis in log scale if the dependence is exponential then it will be revealed by a straight line in a log linear axis that is if f is a function of e power mu then log f is m times u so you have a log linear plot similarly if the function shows a power law behavior then you can discover it by plotting it on a log log scale example if f is u power m then log f is m times log u so log f and log u have a linear dependence or if you plot it in a log log scale you will find a straight line it can also happen that functions show different behavior in different regions for example the function can have a power law u per a for when u is much small compared to 1 and it can have a power law u per b when u is much greater than 1 it may show a smooth transition when u is of the order 1 in this case it is important to obtain values of u that is spread over several decades to be able to distinguish this double power law behavior after we have selected a functional form <clears throat> it is important to use a scientific software to obtain the error analysis let us say we have this non linear function with three parameters a b and c when fitting the function we must provide the confidence intervals of the experimental data and then we must also obtain the confidence intervals of this free parameters a b and c for example c after this fitting is found to be 4.8 plus or minus 0.2 notice that it is not a constant but the c if you notice is the asymptotic value for large value of u u is this one by gr when we, uh, u is large then um, this constant is given by c now this c has a range normally you would report it as only 4.8 but it's not just 4.8 but it is uncertain to within 4.8 plus minus point so that is between uh, 4.6 which is somewhere here and 5 so this constant itself is indeterminate to within a a small value point 2 in gnu plot it is very easy to obtain a this fit and obtain the uncertainties in a single command this takes the error vector in this third column and also returns the uncertainty of all these parameters at the end of data analysis we should have a plot like this <clears throat> this one plot summarizes all the analysis we have done so far firstly each of the experimental points have error bars representing the confidence interval the experimental data is always plotted as discrete points here we have purple circles with this error bars we have also fitted a mathematical function to this data which is denoted by this purple line called as fit the fit function are always plotted as a continuous line not discrete points apart from these two we also have 
two other lines. These two lines represent the knowledge that has been obtained by others. Our regular lab experiments have been studied usually for decades, if not centuries. Many scientists and engineers have worked on this and performed careful experiments. They would have represented their data in terms of some empirical correlations. It is very important to compare our data with their correlations. In this plot, the empirical correlation is denoted by this blue line. It is a common mistake to plot correlation function as points, that is empirical uh, comparison as points. That is not incorrect because the correlation function is also a continuous function and not evaluated at these arbitrary discrete points that we have done the experiments. So empirical correlations must always be a line without any uh, discrete points such as these. Lastly, we should also attempt to compare any theoretical function obtained in some ideal situation. Here, we have shown theory by this constant. So the ideal situation, uh, the theory obtains it as only the asymptotic constant, but in the actual case, you have deviations from this theory. <clears throat> now comes an important part of the experimental analysis. What can we infer from the plots that we obtained? Firstly, observe and note down unusual behavior. While noting down the observations, keep in mind the experimental error bars. For example, from this plot, we can infer that the asymptotic value of NU, that's the Nusselt number, is higher than what, it, what can be expected from either the empirical or the theoretical value. And this is beyond the error bars. So if you see this, the, uh, this is beyond the error bars. Therefore, we say that the asymptotic value is significantly higher than what is expected. Secondly, the initial slope. The initial slope is higher than the slope expected from the other empirical correlations. We can now frame questions for which we'll seek answers. That should deepen our understanding of the experiment. Why is our data consistently higher than the previous measurements? Is the initial uh, higher slope merely because of this or is there something more to it? There is a systematic way to obtain answers. This is called the scientific method. We learn more about this in the second part of this session. Let's conclude this part with a summary. We saw that the experimental measurements are always noisy. It is important to note down at least uh, important to note down least count errors and repeat measurements when possible. From this, we can calculate the confidence intervals of measured as well as derived quantities. We have to use a scientific curve fitting software that takes the confidence intervals and also gives confidence intervals for the fitted parameters. The fit has to be compared with known expressions for empirical and uh, from empirical and theoretical literature. From this comparison, we can observe deviation and frame appropriate questions. Thank you for listening.